Hello there, everyone, and welcome to The Bible Study. We are a multicultural group of believers that serve and emulate the Lord Jesus Christ. Now come with us as we go step by step on this journey through the Word of God in order to study and show ourselves approved, rightfully dividing the Word of Truth. Now join us in today's Bible study lesson. All right, let's go ahead and we'll begin. We're going to open up today. We're going to have our word by um, Missionary um, Shade, and we'll have be followed by Sister Amanda with our actual welcoming. All right, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for gathering us all here this morning or afternoon for some. Um, we just thank you, and we just pray that you bless Pastor Scott this morning and bless him, um, anoint his words, um, have them have full proof show us your love and you know how we can better ourselves and how we need to strengthen our faith and strengthen our prayer life or whatever we know that we need to be doing um and we're not because we worry about things of the world or things that we need to get done um in a day and we put you on our schedule instead of are we put um you have to put you on our schedule we don't put you on our schedules. So Lord, I just pray that you just bless this Bible study this morning. Um, I thank you and I praise your holy name. Amen. 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 Wonderful, wonderful. Sister Amanda. Sorry. Okay. So hi, everybody. I'm Sister Amanda, part of the hospitality department of this Bible study. Um, I wanted to welcome you all on this beautiful, sunny Sunday um today we um the teaching is going to be standing in the gap the power of intercessory prayer um and then also i know tanya brought up last week's facebook group um it's really cool to see how everybody interacts and the questions that are out there and even if you're like a day late like i am <laughs> to answer um it's totally cool because, you know, I was never a first person to finish in a quiz in school anyway. So um, don't forget to invite any of your, <laughs> your friends next week or um, just share, share the word because um, it's meant to be shared. And so I know you guys will all be blessed by today. Have a good one. Amen. Yay. <laughs> we thank God for uh, the opening prayer by um, missionary uh, shade and we do thank God for the welcome and greeting by Sister Amanda. So hopefully all of you feel welcome and uh, we're excited about the lesson today. It's a fantastic lesson. So you got my friend here, Minister Rick Mitchell. So glad to have him. Uh, so it's a wonderful lesson today. Uh, as Sister Amanda uh, alluded to, the actual name <clears throat> of the lesson today is called Standing in the Gap standing in the gap and what standing in the gap i'm referring to is called intercessory prayer intercessory prayer so let me give you uh, three short definitions of what intercessory prayer is because it is one of the most important prayers in the world so number one uh intercessory prayer uh means this is to expose or subject oneself to be used in order to, uh, to, to make up a breach uh, from a failed substance by praying or, or for praying to God uh, as an intervention. It is very important. Another uh, definition for intercessory prayer is to stand in proxy or instead of for the deliverance of others in prayer. Very important. Lastly, uh, intercessory prayer is one who works as an advocate or an attorney or instead of on the behalf of others in prayer. And I'll give you an example how important uh, intercessory prayer is. When you think about a house, or you think about a foundation in a house, that foundation is the most important the actual foundation is what it is built on is so important. And the reason why it's so important is because anything built on that 
it will fall and crumble if it, the foundation is not sturdy, if the foundation is not sure, if the foundation is not of a substance that is balanced so that anything built on top of that will fall. Here's my first question to you all. When you think about a foundation, <clears throat> What do people do when they come into a house? And I'm talking about the floors, the actual foundation. When a person comes into a house and then they find themselves, uh, we come in and we step on the floors. How much do you really think about that floor when you're stepping on it? Minister Scott, how about you? Why don't you tell us a little bit? What do you think about that floor? When you come in a person's house and you're just stepping on that floor and going around, are you thinking about that foundation? Uh, yeah, well, we should be, but no, not necessarily. Just kind of really trust in, uh, just kind of trust in the foundation. We, I do look out for cracks or it's just different sounds uh, and things of that nature, but not, not, not really. <laughs> That's the truth. Not really. When we go into a house, you don't check your floors when you go into your house. You just go into the house, walk right into it, and a foundation can be built of many different materials. As I just mentioned, some floors have wood, some floors have concrete, some floors have slabs with mud, but we generally try to decorate and put things on top of it to make it more comfortable, but in all actuality, that foundation is the most strongest part and the most important part of that actual house. You've got to have a good foundation. And anyone will tell you, if you have a house and it's been built, especially if it's been built from scratch, you know, they allow that foundation time to set. Uh, Sister Tanya, you have a house. Hey, so what is it like to allow? Why do you think they take so much time to let that foundation set? So that, yeah, it, you know, when, when, I mean, even after it's set, you know, sometimes, you know, the ground shifts, you know, if it's hot or cold or whatever. So, um, yeah, it, it's the only way it can stay really firm if it's settled and they, you know. Yeah, it's very important so that we can allow that foundation to set so that, again, it can see if it's balanced. Because in that time, as it is setting, as you just mentioned, things can transpire. And the very same thing in the lives of believers, things can transpire, situations can happen where it can possibly cause some hurt, harm, or danger to us. And it's always good to have someone who's interceding on our behalf. It is very important. Intercessory prayer is very important. Think about it like this. One of the ugliest parts in a person's body, even though we like to get ourselves looking all sprucey and have our hair done. And you know, ladies, you already know, you wanna have your glamor on, your lipstick and you, we, 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 you know, we decorate this outside of our body and everything. But one of the most important parts of the body is our heart. And that heart, even though it is not fashioned to be pretty or anything like that, it is not a pretty thing, but it is essential because that heart who, as the Bible talks about, is one of the less commonly members, the heart is very important to make sure that we take care of it because if that heart does not function, that heart being the centermost part, the functionality of the heart is to make sure the blood gets to all the rest of the body. If the blood does not get to the body, the body will die even though we don't see the heart. And if you do see it, it just looks so bad. But I'm saying, I'm saying all that to say this. Most of the time, when it comes down to inter intercessory prayer, that is one of the last things people want to do when it comes to the house of God. Intercessory prayer is one of the last things that people want to find themselves uh, doing. And the reason why is because you don't get a lot of attention. Like I mentioned earlier about coming into a house, we really don't, and let's just be real, we really don't think about the floor, the concrete. We look at the carpet or we look at the floors and say, wow, you have a great enamel to your floors. Or we look and say, wow, you have some right, really nice floor paneling. Or we say, yeah, that looks really um, nice the way you've had it shellacked and painted. But in all actuality, they don't mean anything if there's no foundation. And think about it. The foundation is what we step on the most. And the reason I'm emphasizing that 
so much is because that is what happens many times when it comes down to the work of God. People don't want to do the less work. In other, in other words, the work, the work that you don't get as much attention. If I were to ask people on a consensus, who would rather, who wants to open up with prayer today? Well, there may be some and there may not be some. The thing is, when we talk about intercessory prayer, it has very little to nothing to do with you. When we pray, many times we pray, we pray about ourselves. We pray about our condition. We pray about our finances. We pray about our, you know, people who are doing things to us. But intercessory prayer is, as I talked about in the introduction, it is about praying for the needs of others. And don't you know that is one of the greatest prayers that you could even make, you could even think about making interceding and praying for others. Let me give you a little bit of uh, some scripture real quick. You won't have to turn to it because I will be recording this video so you can go back and look at some of the scriptures, but I want to kind of bring out some, some uh, popular scriptures that we hear about all the day, all day, but they deal with intercessory prayer. It deals with praying for others. There's a scripture in Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 19 through 20. It says, with two or more should gather together in my name as touching anything, it shall be done unto them. Two or more. The Bible says that one person can send a thousand a flight, but two can send 10,000 a flight. God wants us to be people just like Christ because we are Christ-like and we are Christians. And we do know, according to St. John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. Why? So that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When it comes to intercessory prayer, it is a giving. It is a person having to give of themselves. And don't you know, how we give of ourselves is how God will bless us. Think of it like this. Whatever that is you are needing, that is what God wants you to give in order to have that come back to you. The Bible says it like this, give and it shall come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. By the same measure you meet with all, it shall be measured unto you again. Did you not realize that by the same measure you meet with all, in other words, how you really give and how you really give yourself to praying for others is how prayers will be made and given to you. I want you to think on that because it should stir us up. Today, after I finish, I want us to be stirred up in so much of a way that we all want to pray more. Not just praying for our needs, but want to pray. The Bible says it like this. Pray ye one for another that ye may be healed. Praying for each other. Standing in the gap. When I say standing in a gap, think of a gap. Whatever it is. Whatever that thing that has caused a breach. Whether it's from one cliff to another. Whatever that is that is called a breach or called a separation. God wants us to stand in that gap and pray for that situation. And I'll say this to you, standing in a gap is very important because when we stand in the gap, we are standing instead. And let me just say it like this, when we're praying, we're standing instead of those people. And whoever that is we're praying about or praying for, we should pray believing that God not only hears our prayers, but we'll answer it. That's what standing in the gap is all about. So today I'll be coming out of the book of Joshua. It's an exciting story. I mean, this is a really uh, thrilling story of the book of Joshua, the 10th chapter. And we're going to talk about this situation. And by the time I'm through with this, uh, talking about this in the Bible, we should have a pretty good, clear understanding about standing in the gap, about intercessory prayer, and again, it is the most unselfish prayer in the world. Joshua, the 10th chapter, 
Uh, I'll begin reading just a few scriptures. I'm going to read uh, verses 10 through 13, and then I'll explain it as we go on. So Joshua, the 10th chapter, uh, beginning with verse number 10 through 13, the Bible says this, and the Lord discomforted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth to Bethorum and smote them at Azitlak, Aziklak, and unto Micaiah, and it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down of Bethorum that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekla, and they died. There were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel and said in the sight of Israel, son, stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Agilom. And the sun stood still, verse 13, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. It was and is not this written in the book of Asher? So the sun stood still in the midst of the heaven and have not to go down about a whole day. My God. Wow. So this is what was taking place. Joshua, and let me just give you a little bit of background about Joshua because I'm aware that there are those that may not know about Joshua. So let me give you a little bit of background. Joshua was one of the children of Israel when they were in bondage in Egypt. And we do know the, the Egyptians had the children of Israel, which is the entire nation, in bondage for 430 years. Joshua was 19 years old when he left the actual Egypt. He left with Moses and those others that went through the Red Sea. They were in the wilderness for over 40 years. And we do know when we talk about the wilderness uh, for 40 years, the children of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years because the Bible says, because they did not mix faith with the word of God. And God saw that they doubted and they provoked him over and over for 40 years. And what should have taken two and a half weeks, it took them 40 years to get to the promised land. It is amazing how uh, there are things that if we would just trust God and grow, God would have us to be delivered from certain things and go to a promise, whatever promises God has for us. But because of unbelief, because we don't mix the word of God with faith, then God has to keep us in the same cycle over and over again. While the children of Israel were in, in, in uh, the wilderness, the Bible says God gave, God gave them miracle after miracle after miracle. There were miracles where he gave them water from a rock. There were miracles where he fed them quail and he fed them bread from heaven. There were miracles and he gave them victory after victory. Even Moses, who was fighting in a war at that time, the Bible said uh, when they were fighting against these Amalekites that while they were fighting, Moses would raise his arms up. And when he would raise his arms up, the people had victory, but he got tired and his arms had to go down. And every time his arms went down, the people would start losing. The children of Israel would start losing so that they had to have uh, two people hold actual Aaron, I mean, um, Moses' arms up. And that was Aaron was one and the other one was uh, her. So it was Aaron and her that held Moses' arms up. And while his arms were held up, they had victory. And Joshua was the one who was leading the battle with the children of Israel. And they got victory. So all these things, they had been through the Red Sea. Now they come to the Jordan River. It's been 40 years. And uh, the people provoked Moses to raft. In other words, they got Moses angry. And then next thing you know, Moses... He did something that he shouldn't do. God wanted him to speak to this rock. 
so that they would get water. And Moses got frustrated because the people wouldn't obey God. And he struck the rock. And because of his disobedience, God left him there in a promised land. So to go into the promised land, Moses now appoints Joshua to be the leader to take the children of Israel in the promised land. Well, when the children of Israel went into the promised land, the God opens up the actual Jordan River like he did with the Red Sea. They go through the Jordan River. He gets over there into the promised land and they find out something. The very land that God has promised them are filled with enemies. Even though it is a prosperous land, it's filled with people that hate and dislike the children of Israel. And don't you know, just because you are saved and you love the Lord and God has promise on your life, there are certain things that you're going to have to fight for when it comes to the Lord. And the greatest way to fight is in prayer. The greatest way to fight is in prayer. So I'm going to ask a few questions. Uh, one, one, one question I want to ask, that's one to Minister Mitchell, since my friend you're here. Uh, why do people... Uh, want to fight physically, these are Christians, want to fight things physically more than they do in prayer, spiritually. Well, that's part of being uh, what the Bible refers to as being a carnal Christian. Mm -hmm. When you don't know who you are in Christ, you know, you refer back to the flesh because that's what you're familiar with as opposed to understanding that we, the, the battle is in the warfare, the battle is a spiritual warfare. Yes. You know, and since we live in a physical world, you know, we want to go to the physical means first, as opposed to fighting on our knees. As you, as you mentioned, the whole subject is fighting in prayer. Yes. You know, so I think that's really what it is. We're more, we're more accustomed to uh, fighting a physical in the physical realm, a physical enemy, as opposed to taking the taking to God in prayer. Amen. Amen. Very good. And thank you for sharing. Yes, we're so accustomed to fighting uh, things physically, and we want to figure it out. You know. Uh, we want to know and understand, and we want to get into people's minds because it makes us feel more intelligent when we can figure out, you know, why did they treat me this way? Why are they doing it? But I am telling you, it is not about what we can figure out because the Bible says when it comes to the ways of God, his ways are far above our ways for as high as the heaven above from the earth beneath are God's ways. So I'm learning even more and we should be learning even more that we don't have to figure it out. When it comes down to God's ways, we should just do. The Bible says, be ye doers of the word and not just hearers only. Got my friend here, uh, Prophetess Prince. Uh, why don't you tell us, why do you feel like people, we just don't intercede and we don't pray. We wanna fight and we wanna understand things and fight physically. We wanna deal with things physically, why? Um, I apologize for not being on camera, but I think one of the major things about that is because we still want to be in control. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes down to being in control. And, you know, as humans, we think we're all powerful in all of these things, you know, and, and, you know, our worldly mindsets, again, like um, um, the minister just said, literally it's our carnality trying to take over and be guided by it but these things are not physically physical weapons it's always spiritual so yeah amen amen and, and I thank you so much for sharing you know uh, uh, exactly right a lot of times when we are dealing with things we want to be we like to be able like I said earlier about fi fi figuring it out but the reason why is because people are still carnal. And when I say carnal, uh, carnal represents we bring the world, in other words, how we used to think when we were unsaved to our saved life. And what happened is when we were in the world, we didn't have God on our side. And then we didn't hear about prayer and how prayer, inter intercessory prayer and all the things that God does when people pray we have scriptures that we hear people say, but a lot of times what we do is we think, well, you know what, that may, you know, I don't think that worked for them and worked for that person because I can do this myself. I can figure this thing out. I know I can handle this. And let me just say this as a side note, 
if there's anything that you think you can do in and of yourself outside of God, he won't move. Mm -mm. Because God is not going to share his glory with anyone. If there's something that we think we can handle, oh, God will say, oh, you think you can handle it? No problem. Let me get right out of the way. And let me say it on the opposite side. If there's something that we can deal with, and then we're saying, you know what? I can handle this. I can do it. God is like, okay, that's no problem. Because God wants to show that he is God. Many times the problem with us is we don't treat God like he really is God. The Bible says when we come to God, we must first believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. It is not a big thing to ask God, God, I need some extra money. That's it? Oh, God, I need you to help me pay my bill. Or I need you to uh, uh, fix my car breaking down. Lord, I need to get another car. God is God. And God, he wants us to treat him like God, you know? Imagine, let me just say this to you. If you got, if you got $5 in your pocket, you don't have to believe God for $5 because you got $5 already in your pocket. That's not believing God. What God wants us to do is believe him for the things we can't work out. And each and every one of us should have something that we need God to do. Okay, would you raise your hand? If you have something you need God to do for you, raise your hands. Yeah. And that means that, Lord, we need you to work this out because we can't work it out. That's when God can move and will move. So here we find out Joshua is now in the actual promised land and he finds out they got these enemies there. They got enemies called the Hittites. And these Hittites, the word Hittites mean they were terror. They would terrorize people. The Hittites, they would terrorize people. They got in this land, the Jebusites. The Jebusites were known for having the iron chariots that they would ride and they would destroy enemies with these iron chariots and their men were strong. They also had the Canaanites, which we hear about the most, which were these giants in the land. Did you not know that Goliath, the same Goliath that David fought was actually nine foot, nine inches, nine feet, nine, nine feet tall. We're talking about real giants. There's giants in the land. And this is supposed to be the land of promise. This is the land that God had promised to the children of Israel. And even though he made this promise to the children of Israel, they were going to have to do their part. And the most part that God wanted them to do is to be able to fight in prayer, but not only fight in prayer, but be obedient to God's word. The problem with us, the reason why God doesn't a lot of times move on our behalf is we're not praying according to his word. That's just the truth. And that's why it's so essential to know his word, to know his thoughts, to know his mind. The Bible says, let this mind be in you and me, which was also in Christ Jesus. If we would take on the mind of Christ, we would find out that almost everything we should do or are doing, we should be doing to help others. That's the truth. The actual, uh, the meaning of Christianity or a Christian is to be Christ-like. And Christ always sought to do good for others. So let me go into this story a little bit more. So it's going to get really good. So Joshua goes into uh, Jericho, which was the place that he feared, one of the places they feared the most, because Jericho had these walls that were almost four stories high, and they were almost eight feet thick. Have you seen walls that are like a foot thick? Imagine walls that were eight feet thick. That's just the thickness of the wall. It is recorded in history that this wall that was the walls of Jericho was so humongous and was so great that they used to ride the chariots on top of the actual wall. That's how thick and how big these walls were. And yet the Bible says that when Joshua got into Jericho, God had a plan. And God told Joshua to go down there and he wanted them to go march around their camp 
of actual Jericho six times and make sure you have the priests that were leading and make sure that they had horns, that they had their horns filled with oil and they would march the people around that actual six times and they said, say nothing. You know, sometimes God will ask us to do things to, to us in our natural mind won't make any sense. Sometimes God will have us praying about things and in our mind, we don't know how to figure it out. It doesn't make any sense. But you know what? If we'll just be obedient, God said that we'll get, we'll actually, if we be faithful and obedient, he'll give for us to eat the fruit of the land. So at the seventh time, on the seventh day, God says, I want you to march around the wall to Jericho on this last day, the seventh day, seven times. And at the seventh time, I'll give actual Joshua a signal, and then he will signal the people to just shout and praise God. And the Bible says on the seventh time that they marched around the walls of Jericho, that the, the priests were given a signal by Joshua to go and blow their horns and the people to shout. And the Bible said the walls came tumbling down in so much that whatever people that were left that were inside those walls came running out and they destroyed them. They had victory. They were obedient. So now Joshua is this uh, a leader of those same children of Israel. And he's going out there now destroying each and every one of the enemies. And let me just say this to you all. Whatever God dislikes, we should dislike. Whatever God dislikes, we should dislike. And too many times what we do is we try to bring what we have compromised in our old life into this new life in Christ. And the Bible says, lay aside those weights, those sins that so easily beset us. God wants us to take off the old man and put on the new man, which is in Christ Jesus. He wants us to take off all those things that resemble the world, because as I've said before, the world will treat you like they see you. Ask yourself, how do people treat you? And if you were anybody and you say you were really a sinner and you were a big sinner, then you should be a big saint of God. God should be able to rely on you. And you know what? It takes time to get in God. And because God, he resists the proud. If you're a person that's very proud, proud, God doesn't, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like the people always got to be seen, always got to be heard. Always No, the only time Joshua was fighting these battles and the children of Israel were fighting these battles is because God gave them a promise for a land that was theirs and they fought and they were delivered because of God being with them. So now we enter into the 10th chapter of Joshua and in the 10th chapter, it tells us the story of what I began reading. It tells us the story about what was going on in a place called Gibeon. Gibeon is in the northern side of Jerusalem. And what happened is the Gibeonites, who used to be enemies of the children of Israel, had a peace treaty together with Joshua and the children of Israel. They had a peace treaty that they would fight together. They had covenant with each other. Whatever is an enemy of yours would be an enemy of mine. Whoever would be a friend of mine would be a friend of yours. The only thing about it is, and I want you all to hear this real clear. The only thing about it is that when they made this covenant with Gibeon, there were other enemies that heard about it and their name were the Amorites. The Amorites had five kings at the same time. It's a large area. And when they heard that Gibeon, which was a part of their actual coup, a part of their actual grouping, they heard that Gibeon had made a peace treaty with the children of Israel, then all of a sudden we find out the Amorites, and according to the Bible, the 10th chapter of, of uh, Joshua, all the way to verse number nine, the Bible said that they decided we're going to destroy Gibeon. We're going to destroy all the Gibeonites because they made peace treaties with Joshua. I'm going to talk to you all a little bit. Have you ever noticed 
that it wasn't until you start wanting to serve God that all of a sudden you got some other enemies. Uh, Brother Dion, uh, Minister Dion, won't you tell us uh, what did you do when you, you noticed that you start having enemies when you start serving God? Did you notice this and how did you handle it? Uh, yeah, I did notice it. And um, at first it was hard because of obviously, you know, the flesh and how the flesh wants to fight against certain things. But I just started praying for them every day. Mm -hmm. And when I can think of their names, I just pray for them and just leave it at that. Let God take care of the rest. Amen. Amen. Very good. You know, it isn't until... My goodness, I didn't know I had enemies until I got saved. And the deep part about it is the enemies I had were the people that were used to be my, they were my friends. I was thinking, I don't know about you, I was thinking that everybody was going to be happy. When I got saved, I'm thinking everyone's going to be happy. And then I find out there are people who just did not like me. And I was like, why don't they like me? I'm a, I'm a good person. You know, I'm, I'm a good guy. But no, it was they hated who I represent. Sister Mary, you seem like you're a little cold there, but you'll be all right. Sister Mary, how is it that did, when you got saved, did you, did, did, were there people that, was everybody happy about you being saved? You got to unmute yourself. Ah, oh, no, uh, you're still muted. There you go. No, yeah, yeah. no, absolutely not. In fact, the thing that is astonishing is members of your own family aren't happy about it. Whoa, 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 um, wait, whoa, wait, 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 hold, hold, hold a second. Wait, Sister Mary, did you just say yeah. members of your own yes. family? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have an older son who I was so excited and, you know, we got together and I'm preaching Jesus and blah, 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 blah. And he accused me of being Joel Olstein. <laughs> and, and then, uh, and he was, he was, he was angry. And I think he was angry because I expressed such affection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for some, mm -hmm. someone yes. that wasn't him. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. Hey, listen, I appreciate you sharing that because a lot of times, yeah. The Bible says it like this, you know, uh, Jesus said, I did not come to send peace on earth, but a sword to divide a man's mother from her daughter, a person's father from the son. They of thy own household can be thine enemies, even of your own household. And so if you are having issues with people of your household, it may be the sign that you need to know that you're doing the right thing. Let me tell you this. People don't mind you having religion. What they mind is you having Christ and your lifestyle changes. Minister uh, Emmanuel, what, when you got saved for real, for real, how did your, how did your lifestyle change? Good Lord, uh, it, it changed drastically. Um, and ultimately, at first, you you know, you're so accustomed to your former life and your former way of thinking. You think, man, I had it better. You know, I, I had more friends and I had this and that and the other before I came to this new walk of faith. But um, God slowly, you know, but surely reveals how much indeed he is on your side. And then it brings a good sense of comfort. But uh, when I got saved for real, for real, for real, for real, uh, uh, I noticed that the people that I was just pouring out to, reaching out to, um, expecting to, you know, be comforted in love and relationship, uh, yeah, they just didn't like me. Mm -hmm. And of course, your, your, your physical mind when it related to so many other issues, oh, maybe it's because I'm Black. Or maybe it's because I did this, or maybe because whatever, you know, of, of the past. But um, God just reminds us uh, that we're new creatures. And you realize that all these other people, you know, um, you'll, you'll suffer many afflictions, you know, now walking uh, for, for Christ and living for Christ as well. Um, but that's actually very rewarding. And also it uh, runs parallel to how Christ lived and how he experienced his life. So that was encouraging at the same time. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing. And that's just true. You know, people will treat you the way they, they see you. 
And then the other thing is just like you mentioned, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. But I'm going to tell you all, it does not feel good. It does not. Sister Amanda, have you ever had anybody dislike you for your walk in the Lord? Oh, I'm sure. Um, I was just thinking, you know, like, I don't really pay, Facebook is Facebook, right? But like, when you're posting stuff about just worldly things, and you get all these likes, and it's like, oh, cool, I have these likes, I have friends and whatever. But, and then you post something, you know, a Bible verse or, or just something of, of, of your walk, and then all of a sudden you have like six likes, and it's like, oh, right. what happened to the other hundred? Yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's very true. You know, uh, the world will tell you what they think in their actions. And don't you know, we tell the world what we think by our actions. And this is why we have to live a life that's pleasing to God. And if we live a life that's pleasing to God, he will intervene for us and he will show us that there are really, there are more of us than there are of them. In other words, you'll be surprised that not every friend should, should be a, considered a friend. Because just think about it. If a person's going to dislike me for doing something that's enhancing my life, making me have more peace and joy, and I'm having eternal life out of it, it seems like they would be happy. But instead, it's like, well, you don't drink with us. You can't go out there and and smoke and, and lie and cheat and steal or whatever. No, because I'm a new creature. And as Minister Emmanuel uh, uh, alluded to earlier, old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. So it's very important. So here we are in this situation. Now there is um, this battle that's about to take place. All five of these kings that are Amorites get together and they've surrounded the, the area of Gibeon. And Gibeon gets one of their messengers that gets a message to David and says, come and help us right now. We're about to be slaughtered. Come and help us. This is where we picked up today when I started reading from verse 10. And what took place is that they began to uh, send this message. As they sent the message to David, David got all of his 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 choice warriors, every single one of them, and they began riding out to Gibeon to help them because they knew that these five kings that were Amorites were going to slaughter and kill them, and they came riding with everything. But here's what I love about this story here. The Bible says that David talked to God. He's interceding. He is not wanting, notice this, David is not under any distress. David is not under any, any uh, duress. There's no problem. There's nobody attacking David. There's nobody attacking him, but they are attacking someone he is in alliance with. And I want you all to know this, and I'll say this as a side note, and I'll get right back into the story real quick. Anytime that any of you are attacked, uh, it affects me. So I pray for each and every one of you all every day, some of you more than one or two times a day. And I don't pray like, bless those in the Bible study. No, I pray for you. I actually mention your name. God hears your name every day come before his throne because I'm desiring that he would watch over you, that he would place a hedge about you, that he would allow you to be able to prosper on the earth even as your soul prosper, that he would keep your family, that he would keep your health, that he would make you to be able to grow and receive his ungrafted word, which is able to change your soul. I'm praying these type of things every day for every single one of you. Not that I be glorified because, oh, you're telling us that you pray. No, I want you to know how we know about this story is somebody wrote it, some scribe wrote about it and sent the information to us so we can read it in the word of God. But it's good that we know this. And you should know that in this story, David was in covenant with the Gibeons. And he was like, if you're having a battle, it's my battle also. There is nothing that can come in any of your lives that when I hear about it, and if it's something that hurt you or hurt your family or those you love or anything to keep you away from God, I'm praying just like it's me. 
here's the thought about inter intercessory prayer. The gap, because we're talking about standing in the gap, whatever you fill that gap with has to be of greater substance than what that gap was made of in the beginning. And the reason why is because whatever caused that gap, whatever caused that infringement, whatever caused that thing to come against your life or cause damage to others' lives, it cannot be of the same substance because it wasn't strong enough to keep them. I always tell people this, because people will say, you know what, I wish I just wanted the Lord to take me back to those times when I used to pray more and I used to do all this and I used to do all that. And I say to them, don't do that. And they say, why, why do you say that? I say, because the reason I say I don't want you to go back to what you had is because it wasn't strong enough to keep you from where you are. The reason I do not say to ask God to take you back to what you had is because what you had was not strong enough to keep you from being where you are. You need a greater substance and the greatest substance in the world to build up any gap, any separation, any dissension, any problem is you need somebody, you need people to be praying for you. The church praying for a person has a lot of power. Think about Peter when he was in that prison in the New Testament. The Bible said that prayer was made for him continually of the church and God shook the foundations of the prison. God can move and graze that with ways that we know not of. So here it is. Joshua is here praying to God. God, even though I got all these men and their warriors, we need to understand something. Lord, tell us what to do. And God says, I've given the actual Amorites, I've given the Amorites to you uh, to take over. And then the Bible says, while Joshua is riding hard to this battle, then God decides, I'm going to get in the battle. Whew, let me tell you this. The Bible says, then God began throwing hailstones from heaven down at the people. Joshua, for one, is in there. He's fighting this battle, and him and his men are killing off these Amorites because they get there in time before they destroyed all the actual Gibeons. And Joshua's fighting the battle, killing all these Amorites, and the Bible says that God jumped in it also and started throwing hailstones down from heaven and that God killed more people than Joshua and his soldiers. <laughs> Woo! Let me tell you something. I want you to know, saints of God, if you will put God and intercede on the behalf of others, he will destroy the things, the plots, the plans of the enemy more than what you could have done if you had physically got there and choked him yourself. God is a God that answers prayer. And this is why the Bible said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In the book of Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter, the 30th verse, this is where we get the standing in the gap. The Bible says that God said, I look for a man that could make up the hedge. In other words, someone who would intercede, someone that could build up the gap. And the Bible says, and I found none. I want you to understand the emphasis is on God said, I look for a man. That could be a woman or a child or a boy or a girl. He didn't look for a whole army, a host. He just was looking for someone that would trust him in prayer that he would relieve this actual problem from the people that you're praying for. And God, I hear in my spirit, God is listening and he's waiting to hear your voice pray about the concerns you have in so much that you go full throttle. I must say this to you all as a side note, and I'll come right back to where I'm at. Side note, if you're going to be in anything, be in it all the way. If you're going to be in anything, be in it all the way. I was talking yesterday uh, with my good friend, she's right there, Sister uh, Mary Ketterton. 
And Sister Mary, even though she looks like she's just a regular person, mild man, and you see her with the glasses on, this woman is like Superman on a bicycle. She is the Wonder Woman. Yes, she is. Sister Mary, now I have my other friend, Minister Mitchell. He's on here. He rides bikes all the time. But Sister Mary, at her young, ripe age, rides. She rode 50 miles yesterday for the fun of it. <laughs> for the fun. She's like, oh, hey, Pastor Scott, hey, I just happen to be out here. I want you to see a little bit of the Wisconsin. See the hill area? You see the mountain? You see the white part? That's snow. And see the little, that's the, that's the water there. And I'm riding down these streets, and I'm riding down this hill. And, I, and you see that right there? 50 miles. I was like, oh my God, she probably rode out of Wisconsin. Matter of fact, I need to look out of my window and see if I see her in Georgia. Goodness. The thing is, she's dedicated to it. And whatever you are dedicated to, people should be able to see it. We don't do what we do for the Lord to be seen, but we should be seen doing what we do for the Lord. Joshua is fighting this battle because he knows God has said, I've given you the victory. So he's fighting this battle, but not only is God giving him the victory, God's in the battle with him. The Bible says that they began chasing all of these actual Amorites all throughout the valleys, all throughout the hills, all throughout the forest area. They're chasing them all over everywhere, killing them as they run into them, but they have one thing. There's a problem. The problem is, is now it's evening tide. The actual sun has gone down. It's about to go down. And they can't see them. If the sun goes down, it's not like they were fighting in the city of New York or the city of Atlanta or the city of Washington. No, they're actually fighting out here in the open. And if the sun goes down, they won't be able to see them and the enemies will go away. And the Bible says this, and Joshua prayed to the Lord and said, God, he looked at the sun and said, sun, stand still over the land of Gibeon. Moon, stand still over the land of Jeshurun. And the Bible said that God held the sun to stand still in that sky, would not allow it to move for the space of a day so that Joshua could have victory over the enemies of not Joshua. These were enemies of God. And I want you to know anything that tries to destroy the work of God and the people of God, God calls them enemies. And God will move whatever he's got to move on your behalf in order to see you prosper and be able to deal with these people trying to destroy you. I want you to know the Bible said that God held the sun in the sky. Let me give you a little information. The sun is located 92,573 million miles away. One prayer held the sun for 24 hours in the same place, which was located 92,594 92, million miles away. The earth that we live on even though this was in the little speck of the earth, a place called Jerusalem, can fit one million earths into the sun. One million earths. And God said that he was just looking to hear anyone. He's looking for someone to intercede. He's looking for someone to pray, and he's looking for them to give him things to do as a God, not as a regular person. So that God not only set the sun in the sky, he set the moon at night so it would not move at all either. For the space of 24 hours, just so that Joshua could get the victory. And I want you to know that intercessory prayer is the most 
powerful prayer in the world. Last year, last year, 2020, they have a, um, these are a, a league of atomic scientists that actually work together with a royal, they're called the Royal Astrology uh, Society. And what they do is they study the skies and they've been studying the skies and all the uh, galaxies and the cosmos and even into the black hole. And they discovered that there was one they could identify by writings and things that were archaeologically found at certain times. And as they watched and looked over these things in the sky and also with archaeologists, they came together. They discovered that in October 30th, 1207 BC, there was one day that the actual sun stood still for 24 hours. And that was the exact same time as it happened when Joshua prayed. So I'm saying this to you, brothers and sisters, people of God, we got God on our side. And whatever that is that is ailing you, whatever that is that is making you to fear and you feel like God may not work this out, it's time for us to do some intercessory prayer because if God can hold a sun up in the sky, what is that little situation you're dealing with? What does that mean? What is the situation that you want God to move for? How does that actually, how does that actually equate to anything? Because if we will trust God and we will believe God, and being God, as the Bible says, when we go to God, believe that he is God and he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. Why don't we continue to seek him even more? And as we seek him, he's going to take care of our issues. When Joshua got finished fighting, all of the actual people were slaughtered and the five kings that were against them, he took all five of those kings out of a cave that they were hiding in, but they couldn't hide because the sun was still up and he got those kings and hung them all on trees and let their bodies sit there so that people would know that their enemies, whoever the enemies are of the people of God are also God's enemies. And in that day, as I said, God killed more of the enemies than Joshua did with the sword and his men because God rained down hailstones from heaven. So listen, that's as far as I'm going to go today. We're almost at our closing. And I want to thank you all for understanding that we've been talking about standing in the gap. I really want to encourage you. It's time to pray, people of God. It's time to trust God like we've never trusted God before. And I'm just believing God for the big things. I'm not going to sit here and get my mind focused on these little things and let them try to get me thrown off. No, if there's any situation, uh, anything that we can actually uh, do to order to see each other be blessed, the Bible says, pray ye one for another that ye may be healed. And I pray that you are healed by the word of God today, that you all are encouraged to pray and intercede, that you all know that God is on your side. And it's surely, surely, if God can stop uh, uh, a sun and a moon from going down for 24 hours, your situation, my situation, it's nothing. So without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and we're going to end at this point here. I'm going to ask that uh, Minister Scott, Minister uh, Emmanuel Scott, will go and uh, end us with a word of prayer today. Dear Heavenly and Most Gracious Father, we come before your precious throne of grace in the name of Jesus. Thank you for Pastor Scott delivering this uh, powerful word of faith. Lord, uh, ask that you help it to resonate within our hearts and to be encouraged to, on a daily, daily basis, pray without ceasing, interceding for others, um, for whatever our needs may be, Lord. You know our needs, Lord. You know the desires of our hearts, so we can worry about them later because you, you already have handled those. We thank you for uh, giving us a heart and mind to be able to pray for others, Lord, because when you come together in your name, you are in the midst, Lord, and you are with us, and you are on our side. And if you be before us, who can stand against us, Lord? I thank you for your uh, uh, great word of faith and I ask that you uh, keep us uh, throughout this week. Keep us meditating on this word day in and day out, Lord. Let us be encouraged to go back over this uh, powerful word because it was just jam-packed and fully loaded with your foolproof word of God. Uh, thank you for um, 
Thank you for all the members of this Bible study, Lord, and let them be blessed and encouraged through this message and hold uh, hold to this profession of faith always in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much. Thank you all for joining with us today. We'll be back next Sunday at the same time. Powerful message next week. Uh, not because it's from me, but it's from God. And uh, thank you all for my, to my dear friend, uh, Prime Minister Mitchell. I uh, see some other friends of mine. Uh, just thank God for all of you. And we'll talk to you all soon. God bless. I'll have this posted at the uh, end of the, today. So if you want to see it again, it'll be at the end of today. God bless you. Bye-bye.